It's my proud privilege to invite Dr. David Frawley to deliver his address. Namaste, honorable members on the dais. I just heard two very wonderful speeches and I'm very happy with the insights you are bringing into uh, this program. It is my honor to be here uh, before you today. I arrived here actually from the United States a couple of days ago and I flew in from Delhi this morning so I feel half of my being is still on the airplane. I am very happy to be in Hyderabad again. I have done a number of programs here over the years, particularly with the Pragna Bharati back in the 1990s. One of the programs that I did, we had a debate with the Archbishop of Hyderabad, Bishop Arulapa, over the issue of conversions. I think that was in 1997. In recent years, I've continued to come to India, but I have not been so much in Hyderabad itself, so I'm happy to be back again. However, recently, as of last uh, October, I was in Bhimli in Vishakapatnam with Sadhguru Sri Shivananda Murti, and I would like to pay my obeisance to him. He is one of the great gurus of India, and you are very, ha you are very honored to have him nearby and I recommend all of you to visit with him and uh, seek his guidance because I think he has all the real practical answers to all the human and social problems uh, today. I look forward to visiting uh, with him in the future as well. In October of 2010, with him at Beamley, we did a world conference on mundane astrology dealing with the issue of 2012 or what will happen uh, to the world in the year 2012 which various groups including these uh, Mayan thinkers have said would be a very crucial year for humanity and astrologically we can say that uh, not a lot is happening in 2012 via specific events, but we rather see a difficult era coming up for humanity in years to come. I called it in my recent newsletter, a new time of troubles, uh, not simply one cataclysmic event or big war or major outer problem, but continued pressure and problems socially, environmentally, uh, financially in the wake of so many difficulties going on in the world today. My heart goes out to the younger generation because the older generation, which I have now become part of, we really haven't left you a lot positive to look forward to. We have given you some tools, but the world in the 21st century as our Venerable Swami has said, is it a make or break crisis? I live in the United States. You think of the United States as a very progressive country, uh, which in some ways, scientifically, technologically, it is. But I'll give you an example to the mismanagement that our country has. In this last year, the United States government took in $2.2 trillion and they spent $3.8 trillion or nearly double the budget. If this trend continues by the year 2019, the United States will be a bankrupt country. So far, there is no plan to deal uh, with that debt. Uh, Europe also is under a tremendous debt right now, also because they had a welfare state that they were unable to fund properly. And yet at the same time, these are the countries running the global economy and if these countries go down economically, socially, the rest of the world goes down, including India and China. And we already today see the pressure coming on India today. 
and we see India's own problems, particularly the tremendous corruption you have in this country. India has a government which has no accountability. I'm not saying this as a political criticism, but you have a government uh, overall where there is no sense of responsibility for what goes wrong or no willingness to take the blame or correct the problems going on. And we have all over the world this rapid and continued growth in consumerism. We have this tremendous growth of the media and so many unrealistic desires that people have. Now you have a generation of young people which is seeing all these technological and media-based wonders, but at the same time, many or most of them do not have the means to get these for themselves. So there is a great frustration that is brewing in the population. In India, you of course have a very large rural population, which to a large extent is not part of the economic development or boom uh, going on. And we also see that where this economic development has succeeded, Europe, the United States, the people are not at all happy. In the United States, there is an epic of a depression going on, particularly in people above 50 years old, but affecting the population as a whole. The cause of depression is very simple. It's stimulation. The more stimulation you take from the outside, the more depression you have on the inside because you're depending upon the external for your happiness. Over time, you have to continually increase this level of stimulation. The movies become more violent. They become more sensual. They become more disturbing because they need to stimulate you more. And the average human being, we're spending more time behind the box. The box is the screen. It is the computer. And our minds, we're behaving more like a box. We're becoming more mechanical, more superficial, and more politically reactive. Even today, religion has become mainly a political phenomenon. And there is very little of sadhana left within the religions of the world today. Now, I do not want to paint an entirely bleak picture. Uh, there is always an extremity and opportunity, but there is certainly a tremendous challenge. And here also I wish to address the issue of the Hinduism or the Sanatana Dharma. And the first thing I want to say is what we call religion is largely an illusion. There are no separate religions of the world. The separate religions of the world are like national boundaries. You have national boundaries between India, Pakistan, China, countries of Europe, United States, and so forth. But there's no real place on the geography of the globe that these differences truly exist. They're man-made. Religion is also a man-made difference. Religion means to unite, but mostly what we call religion has served to divide people. We may have one God, but we have two humanities as the saved and the not saved, as the chosen by God, as the rejected by God. So that religion is not serving its role, when the human being takes birth, you do not have a religious identity stamped upon your body. It is something that's given to you by your society. Now in India, you have this religion called Hinduism. Why is it called Hinduism? Because it did not need to define itself against the other. You know, the other religions have their chosen people and then the outsider. The Hindus were defined by the outsider because the Hindus did not have an outside. As the Sanatana Dharma, they were able or willing to include everyone. There is not in Hinduism an address of one community. It is the Manava Dharma, Sanatana Dharma, Universal Dharma, Human Dharma, universal in the sense of seeking that truth which is eternal and relevant to 
all human beings. So there's essentially only one spiritual path or approach or collection of paths as the Sanatana Dharma. It is also the religion of nature in the sense that it includes all of nature, all of life, all natural, and all historical approaches to the spiritual life. And that teaching is still with us today. It has survived because of India. But that teaching was once spread all over the world. And to a certain extent, we can find aspects of it or fragments of it all over the world, particularly when we look back in time uh, to the pre-Christian, to the era before the organized religions, something like Sanatana Dharma was followed all over the world where you had the worship of the sacred fire, the sacred waters, the sacred plants, the cosmic consciousness, the light of the sun. You had living in harmony with the greater universe, not simply as a material phenomenon, but the whole greater universe of consciousness. And we see this early influence uh, in Europe through the pre-Christian traditions, the Celts, particularly the Greeks, the Romans, even the old Slavic, Germanic traditions. I also live in the United States in a part where the Native Americans are still predominant. And unfortunately, they're also still being suppressed. And in some areas, there's still genocide against them going on. But they also followed a tradition of the sacred fire, the sacred dances, the sacred chants, the honoring of the universe through the sky, the waters, the clouds. So that tradition uh, was also there. So when organized religion came onto the scene, it created one community against another. On one hand, it denied the validity of the local traditions. On another hand, it spread this idea of religion as a belief and salvation by belief. There is no salvation by belief. In fact, there is no salvation at all. Salvation is a human term. We are naturally part of that universal dharma, and we, our duty is to know that dharma, be in harmony with that dharma, and to be part of that dharma of the universe in our entire daily life. That is why Hinduism is a way of life. It is not simply a belief that you can take up in a short uh, ceremony and then suddenly you're saved because some force, some being has changed your name or changed your uh, identity. So Hinduism represents that universal religion that has pervaded all of nature and pervaded all of life. Now, even historically, Hinduism was the, a dominant religion along with Buddhism, another dharmic related path. As far away as the Philippines and Indonesia to the east and well into Afghanistan, Iran, and even further to the west, even over the last 1500, 2000 years. Even Vietnam was largely a Hindu country until the 17th century. Uh, so there was that also that spread of more the classical Hinduism, which is why you have Angkor Wat in Tibet, and why, I mean Angkor Wat in, uh, in Cambodia, and why we have so many Hindu temples and uh, monuments throughout uh, Southeast Asia. But when India itself became under siege, which it did through the foreign invasions and the mis uh, missionary efforts, then Hinduism also became contracted and to a certain extent closed in on itself and also unwelcoming of outsiders because a lot of the outsiders they saw were people seeking to destroy or even plunder the country. This situation changed at the end of the 19th century with Swami Vivekananda and Hindu teachings began to spread worldwide again and we would have to say that a lot of the most progressive trends, at least spiritually, in the Western world over the last hundred years have their roots in the Hindu Dharma, whether it is the movement towards yoga, meditation, natural healing, mantra, 
so many things, psychological well-being, the Hindu Dharma has had a very powerful effect at the level of ideas. So I propose to you that we are also entering an, a new phase in which the Hindu Dharma can expand and grow globally in a very significant way and will continue to do so for the future. The main problem today is that the people following these things do not always know where they come from and they do not always credit India or Hinduism for it because many groups have taken these ideas and given credit to themselves for them. They put their name on it, they put their brand on it. Even in America today there's so many brand names of yoga they ask you what yoga do you follow. By brand name it's a style of asana as if yoga was nothing but a different style of asana. So as Hinduism began to spread again there was a global acceptance of many of the great Hindu ideas and practices but there was no background understanding of Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma to go along with it for the most part. And we cannot entirely blame the teachers who brought Hinduism to the West because Hinduism was a negative term for people in the West. In fact, I saw something very interesting. It was a document signed by the governor of the state of California in 1910 stating that Hindus were heathens, they were unclean, and they should not be allowed in the state by point of law. This was actually only 100 years ago and after the time that Swami Vivekananda had already visited the Western world. Tremendous prejudice was going on. Swami Yogananda had several threats on his life while he was in the United States. So because of that, the Hindu gurus came to the West, but they, didn't permade, they did not make Hinduism so well known. They emphasized yoga, or they emphasized their own sampradaya. Or they said, I am a universal teacher, and I teach all religions, including Hinduism. I have all the religions, the people of all the religions following me. Here's where I have some critique or difference with some of the modern teachers for their way of expression. Any Hindu teacher coming, any teacher coming out of the Hindu tradition is going to have a sense of universality. But that is coming from the Sanatana Dharma itself. It is not simply coming from that teacher or from that particular sampradaya. Hinduism itself, as the Sanatana Dharma, is inherently something universal. It is not one religion among many. So one sect of Hinduism cannot say we're universal and Hinduism is just part of the many religions that are part of us. We need to resurrect that greater sense of the Sanatana Dharma behind all these great teachers and teachings. And now is the time where we can do that again, not only in India but also in the Western world. It's interesting to note that in America today and also in UK, the Hindus are the most affluent religious community along with the Jews. The average Hindu in America makes twice the amount of the average Christian and has a much better education. That has also changed the image of Hinduism in the West and it continues to change. We also see that as far as the pervasion of Hindu ideas, more than a quarter of the people in the United States by several surveys have now accepted the principle of rebirth and karma, even though, again, they may not religiously define themselves formally as Hindus. And all over the United States, for example, I live in a city of about one lakh or 100,000 people, and we have over 65 yoga teachers uh, in the town, and we also have more than, I don't know, 20 meditation teachers and there is a, when uh, Amaji comes, Sri Amrita Andamai comes to the town, often there'll be as many as 5,000 people attending her event 
And this is in the middle of the southwestern desert. It's not in one of the major urban areas of the United States. We see a widespread interest in these ideas. So what I've been doing over the last 20, 30 years is I've been active in all these related fields of the Vedic studies. Ayurvedic medicine, Vedic astrology, yoga, Raj Yoga, Vedanta, Vedic studies, translations of the Vedas, and also this whole historical issue of the antiquity of the Vedas. And our work is also to draw the connections between these things for people so they can see the greater Sanatana Dharma behind that. And now we are seeing more of that occurring. For example, now a lot of the yoga centers in America have Ayurveda, some will have Jyotish, then we'll now have pujas and yagyas. And we see this trend growing more and more that there is at least a realization of the Vedic connection between all these Vedic teachings and disciplines. And then we try to take them one step further and show the greater connections with the Sanatana Dharma. However, outside of India, we look at the Sanatana Dharma in a little different way in the sense that we're not looking so much at India's problems. However, I would like to state that India, of course, has its own special problems. And Hinduism seems to be more under siege inside of India than outside of India. And it seems to have less governmental support inside of India than outside of India. I have some friends in Italy who run the Italian Hindu Union. You know, up to a few years ago, Hinduism was not recognized as a religion in Italy, in spite of the Italian connections of the Indian government. Uh, so this group got Hinduism recognized so that you got a Hindu marriage in Italy. So they had a meeting and they said, we're going to invite the ambassadors from all the countries of the world to our opening in Rome. So they did. And every, so many came, the Russian came, the 